What is ROS? That's a great question. ROS stands for the Robot Operating System, but it's not really an operating system. It's more like middleware. Uh, so let's dig into that a little bit. First of all, a little bit of background about robots. Uh, you're probably familiar with these two that are shown here. Um, yeah, one's just a toy, one's an appliance you might buy at the supermarket uh, or at, at the store. Um, pretty common, uh, but they represent uh, a, a, you know, a history of robots which may not be exactly where we're at now. We're actually uh, transitioning to a really interesting new stage of robots where uh, we have robots that are with people. They operate with people closely nearby people and their industrial robots. Whereas before, our industrial robots would be on their own separate network and behind a, a physical you know, barrier to prevent, protect people's safety. Now we see them wandering around supermarket shelves along with the rest of customers in supermarkets that aren't even familiar with robots. And these robots are doing tasks like inventorying shelves. We also see robots doing tasks like delivering food to college students, to uh, folks inside cities and, and, and uh, more urban areas, um, very common. Of course, you're, you're familiar with other headline uh, uh, robot uses for things like uh, 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 assisting in medical fields or uh, self-driving cars and so on and so on. All this speaks to uh, robots moving into mainstream, being connected to the same networks as other computers and being more accessible. Uh, and a lot of that uh, you'll see is driven by and supported by ROS being the open source premier and a repository for a lot of general purpose libraries so that these robots don't have to be built from scratch. So the next thing I want to do is take a quick look uh, at the history of ROS, just so you understand how we got to where we're at. You'll find the ROS open source community uh, at ROS.org. Uh, ROS comes out of uh, an, a, an original project over a decade ago known as Willow Garage. Uh, and now uh, ROS is spearheaded by Open Robotics, the Open, uh, uh, open Robotics uh, 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 nonprofit organization actually is the leader for the ROS community. Um, on the ROS homepage, you'll see how to download and install, as well as a lot of the support uh, for how to get started and how to install and how to work with ROS. All the ROS codes, as I mentioned, is open source, uh, has the community to go with it. It's a very active community, uh, and you'll find the ROS projects uh, all available on GitHub. There's a lot of documentation to go with it as well. You'll find that anchored off of the ROS.org wiki, uh, installations, getting started, and so on. As I mentioned, ROS has been around for over a decade, uh, and it started out as an academic exercise. Uh, about three years ago, uh, the community recognized that ROS needed some fundamental changes in order to make it support uh, where robotics was heading in order to uh, support industrial mainstream commercial products running on the open source ROS infrastructure. So based on that, uh, a project was started, kicked off to do the next generation of ROS, ROS 2. Uh, all the documentation on how ROS 1 was migrated to ROS 2 uh, and continues to be migrated uh, is available through design.ros2.org. Uh, so you can see how this is migrated. The key thing for you to keep in mind is that generally ROS1 and ROS2 are not interoperable. You can bridge them so that you can have one robot that uses ROS1 and ROS2 parts, but you have to be very aware of whether you're working in ROS1 or ROS2. Uh, ROS2 is, uh, is, is a viable product right now, uh, and there are robots working on it. There are many more working on ROS1, but the ROS1 community is definitely migrating to ROS2. One of the key things that's different with ROS2 is the uh, networking infrastructure. ROS1 had a hub and spoke single point of failure design, whereas ROS2 has a much more robust uh, messaging peer infrastructure or protocol known as DDS uh, for uh, dynamic data services. 
You can find more about how to uh, install and work with ROS on index.ros.org. We're going to be working through the installation here. Uh, and after we're done here, if you want to learn more about ROS, I'd highly suggest walking through the tutorials. They do everything from how to get started with ROS as well as uh, doing some, some very advanced uh, development in both uh, Python and C++ uh, and everything else along the way. Okay. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the kind of basic uh, uh, basic structure of how a robot's put together. What's our conceptual model? It's based, first of all, on a computer. Uh, the robot's running a computer. Our robot is going to be running a Raspberry Pi. There's an application that makes the robot run that runs on that computer. Usually it interfaces with technology through these general purpose libraries. Um, they'll have a data bus, so typically a USB connection to a controller. Uh, a controller will make a digital connection to a driver, uh, and then the driver translates that digital signal into an analog signal to actually make uh, an effect in the real world in the case of an actuator, or to sense something from the real world uh, in the case of uh, a sensor. So this allows the robot to interact with the real world. And that's the big difference between a robot and most of the other computer systems you've dealt with. Other than that, same concepts apply. You have a computer that's running software uh, and that software makes an effect. If I look a little bit more at how ROS fits into the mix, as middleware, we write ROS applications that take advantage of all the rich libraries that uh, are provided with ROS. ROS also gives us this communications ability so that I can spread my application across multiple computers if I want, or I can take nodes and move them into other places, move them uh, on the same computer or onto a different place. Other than that, all of this remains the same. I still need I.O. to control different parts of my robot and to read from sensors. All this is done through one one set of standard constructs that ROS exposes, uh, and that's nodes, parameters, topics, services, and actions. So let's look at take a look at those five things. A node is essentially a low-level computational process. So within my robot, all of my things are pulled together into a node. Uh, so that you can think of as a process. Uh, then I have parameters. Parameters are just simply multivariate dictionary. It's a dictionary that describes the robot. So you can ask of certain variables or set certain variables and parameters uh, within those parameter functions, all built into the ROS construct. It gets more interesting when you think about topics, services, and actions. These all belong to a node. So within a node, you can request to create a new topic. Uh, a topic is a simple message infrastructure, a messaging uh, structure. Uh, it's a publish and subscribe, pub sub messaging structure, two way uh, receive or send messages. So you can create a talker on a topic that sends a message out, and you can create a subscriber that listens to messages on a topic. So that's how communications and data happens back and forth, exchange back and forth between nodes. Uh, within that, we also have services. So nodes can host services that ask a node to do something or ask a robot to do something. Your services are typically a synchronous request. So the service will block until the request is complete. Actions within a robot are where you can ask a robot to achieve a goal, move to a certain place, move to, you know, put yourself in a certain position or figure out how to do a thing. That's an action. As the robot takes time to do that action, it'll feed back to us and tell us how well it's doing. It'll tell us when it's achieved. It'll tell us if it's been blocked by that. Uh, so between these three constructs available to nodes, uh, uh, topics, services, and actions, we're able to put robots together. 
So where ROS fits into this is it, it exposes these in a very standard way to all the parts of the robot. Whether you're talking about the robot hardware or you're talking about how the robot communicates with its environment and with other uh, parts of the robot or talks across different machines, um, all of that is built into the lower level of ROS. At the higher level of ROS, you see the advanced application. So if I use these standard interfaces of topic services and actions that are created by nodes, now I can have uh, something like a 3D object recognition application plugged right into ROS, or a navigation application, or a movement application that allows a jointed arm to, to move to a certain location. All those things are standalone applications that actually have shims into ROS. They've been exposed to ROS by the open source community. So you can just plug those in uh, and then you plug in different hardware and everything will work. The last thing I'll mention is client libraries. Client libraries you'll find uh, really helpful. Uh, these are essentially the different programming languages that ROS exposes for you to use. Uh, the primary ones are C++ and Python. So within C++ code, within Python code, you can create nodes. You can have nodes subscribe to topics and perform actions. Uh, however, there are a number of third-party client libraries as well, Node.js, Java, and so on. So we can actually uh, combine multiple programming languages into one robot. They all talk through nodes uh, and, and these constructs. So with that in mind, uh, let's get back to uh, building out our robot.